Today, we're going to actually be talking about my top 10 programs that I personally use in order to run my virtual desktop games. So we're going to go down a list. Uh, it's not really in any particular order, although the first one is definitely the reason I'm able to do any of this stuff virtually. So hopefully you can get a taste for how I run my games, how I'm able to keep the experience virtual while making it somewhat feel like we're still crowded around a table together, even though we're technically not. So let's go ahead and dive right into it. So the first thing and uh, that we'll go over, the first thing I have open is Foundry Virtual Tabletop. There are, believe, five or more different virtual tabletops that are available on the market currently. And all of them have their different pieces of the puzzle that they fit. Virtual Tabletop is fairly new. I believe it's only been out for about a year, maybe more, maybe less. Don't quote me on that. But it brings a functionality that I haven't seen in any other virtual tabletops. And what I mean by that is that it is client-based. So this is running on my computer. As you can see down here, it's got its own little icon. So it's utilizing my computer's resources in order to uh, essentially stream the game to my players. What it does is it generates a link uh, using your IP address for them to join via any browser that they use. They hop into the game, they have a code, they type in the code and they're granted access to the game. Virtual Tabletop has all the functionality of any other virtual tabletop out there. It's got your little chat box on the right side uh, that has a little encounter tab. This is the scenes tab where, you know, I can go, I can create different scenes and with a click of a button, I can switch between them in order to show my players what environment they're currently at. Um, maybe uh, I like, I've been doing these theater of the mind maps a little bit which is something unique to virtual tabletop is the fact that there are a bunch of community members come together and they build these modules, mods, just like, you know, if you're modding Skyrim or some other video game or something like that, except for it's for the virtual tabletop itself. What it does is it essentially gives you these, like you can sort of see this ambient light that's kind of blinking and things like that. You can do this on other virtual tabletops, I believe. I haven't honestly tested it, but uh, Roll20 was the virtual tabletop that I came from. And in order to get any type of functionality like this, you have to be paying a monthly subscription uh, or a yearly subscription to do it. And the reason I like Foundry a lot better is because it's a one and done payment method. Once you pay the 50 bucks, you have the key and the uh, utility of the program for life. You never have to pay any more. Uh, you don't have to pay anything less. There are ways to get your game hosted onto a server such as like Amazon AWS or they've got one called Foundry out there. Those you have to pay monthly subscriptions in order to keep your game hosted elsewhere. But if you're using it for your local device, which I prefer because then I get everything on my machine. I can utilize all of the resources that I've collected over the years in terms of PDFs, in terms of maps, uh, NPC character sheets, uh, character images, things like that. All of that gets saved onto my computer and I can just essentially drag and drop it, pull it to the game immediately when I need it. It's a lot easier, I think, that way than having to try to host it via a server, but to each their own. So Foundry has a lot of versatility in terms of being a virtual tabletop because of the fact that, you know, the mods that get made are made from the community. So you can you can go onto the subreddit and things like that and request mods to be created. And if someone has the coding expertise, they can create it for you, implement it into the game. It's awesome. So that's my number one. Uh, the second piece of software that I use is voice meter. Is specifically, I use voice meter potato. Now, in a virtual environment, especially running the game as a DM, 
I have a lot of different sounds and resources that I have creating these sounds that I want to either provide on my stream, provide in Discord, or provide just to myself. And the cool thing about voice meter is that it gives you the functionality of being able to apply those sounds and link them to the devices that you want using all types of virtual cables and things of that nature. So as you can see right now, uh, currently I've got two microphones. One of them is the actual microphone that I use uh, for when I'm not playing D&D. Morphox is actually the next program that I'll be taught or one of the next programs I'll be talking about. Um, Discord has its own virtual cable. So if I want my stream to hear what's going on in Discord or if, you know, maybe I want to uh, bring something to Discord, I can actually send and use my microphone to Discord with this software. I can ha I can control all the sounds that come from my internet browser, Spotify, iTunes. That's what I use this cable for. And then my soundboard, I have its own cable, um, which, you know, just because I don't use it all the time, but I also don't want it to be, I don't want it to be partnered with either of these other virtual cables. Then you got all these outputs that you can put on here and that way I can control, I can control where my microphone's going. Is it going to Discord? Is it going, can I hear myself? If I were to click this uh, A3 and now I can hear myself, and I believe you can hear me twice, which is really annoying. But that's the versatility you get with voice meter is being able to link your sounds, port them to the locations you want them to go and nowhere else but that. So voice meter is definitely the second most utilized piece of software that I have. Um, not just for D&D though, for my everyday. I, I absolutely love it couldn't imagine uh, playing without it. Uh, the next piece of software is, of course, Discord. This is the way that my party and I are able to connect and speak with each other. I'm trying to convince them all to use their webcams uh, on Discord so that I can capture all of that and actually put it into my OBS stream. But so far, they haven't come through with doing that. So Discord, if you don't know, it allows you to create a essentially a private voice server for you to give a code to anybody. They can join it. You can make all types of different channels uh, over here on the left. This shows you all the different members of the Discord and things like that. If you're the administrator or the creator of the server, you have a lot more, uh, I guess, flexibility, a lot more creation that you can actually post into um, the Discord and make different channels and things like that. So I have my own like D and D, you know, tab. So anything related to D and D is going to be in this tab. So my players can go. We can talk D and D. They can see the announcements I post there. They can read the story of like the session notes and things like that. So Discord is just all around. It's if you're not on Discord, I don't know what rock you're living under, honestly, because it's such like it's such a great way to connect with people, especially when you're playing D and D. Um, just because it gives you the element of being able to voice chat and use the video chat if you want as well. That way, you're sort of tying everybody together into the similar experience of a face-to-face -face game. The next piece of software that I use is this uh, program called Morphbox. And Morphbox is a voice changing software, but it also gives you a little extra, I guess, control over how your microphone sounds as well. Although if you're streaming, um, if you're using voice meter, I would recommend using a single program to modify your voice and your microphone settings instead of because if you modify it here then it goes to voice meter then it goes from voice meter to like OBS and if you got different settings for all of them it'll end up uh, more than likely creating conflicts within each other which might make your mic sound terrible so what I use it for is I use it to do uh, general 
changes to my voice that are more dynamic in nature as opposed to like fine tuning. Uh, for instance, this is my Smaug, aka the dragon from Lord of the Rings, the Hobbit. And I use this anytime my party encounters a dragon and I want to talk like a dragon. So when you hear this, they know that they're talking to a dragon. I also have others. This is a NPC that I created. And you tell you can tell the vast amount of customization you can have with the voice. There's all of these effects. Uh, there's the voice equalizer. This is how you tweak the voice to make it sound higher or lower. And then there's also a there's a built-in soundboard. I don't use it. I used to. Um, like I mean, it, it's cool, but the the functionality is very bare bones and basic. You have to put a lot of time and effort into getting everything, I guess, sorted the way you want it. So I don't use this at all for the soundboard capabilities, but those are added to it. So Morph Vox is it's how I change my voice if I'm not able to physically make that voice for my party to hear. Next thing we'll go over is Jingle Palette. So Jingle Palette is a free software that allows you to make a bunch of palettes as a soundboard. So if you uh, recall on my voice meter, I had soundboard as one of my cables. This is where those sounds are coming from and being ported to. So every time I click one of these, <laughs> It actually, the way I've got it set up is that it plays that sound through my microphone. So anything that is set up to my microphone, which right now for you guys is OBS, you guys will hear it as if I'm speaking. <laughs> so you just link these sound files to the palette. You can save them and you can make, I'm pretty sure you can make infinite amount of them if you wanted to. And anytime you need to play one, you just click on where it's located. Ooh, ooh. And you just play the sound and it immediately plays it. You can have it loop and do some other things on Jingle Palette. I don't use many of those because a lot of the soundboards uh, or a lot of the sounds that I have on my soundboard is literally just a in the moment, press it, let the sound happen, and then I'm done with it for now. So I use it from one of my NPCs. Uh, because I use his laugh as the Happy Mask Salesman from Legend of Zelda series. And anytime he talks to him, like after he completes a sentence, he always chuckles in that uh, really creepy sounding, you know. <laughs> exactly. So that's that's the that's Joker, actually, from my campaign. Quite fun. I love that character. So that's Jingle Palette. The next uh, bit of software, you can go with any PDF viewer that you want to, uh, but I personally use this one. Uh, this one is called uh, Sumatra PDF. The reason I use this one is it doesn't have a lot of the tools, I guess, that like Adobe PDF does, but because it doesn't have all those tools, it also doesn't utilize all those resources. So even though I've got a really beefy computer in terms of my RAM and CPU, uh, I'm able to utilize, I would be able to utilize Adobe, but I like this because now it's just one less thing I have to worry about. I do have Adobe installed if I need to make any edits to my PDFs and things like that. But on my, one of my, uh, peripheral monitors, I actually have this open all the time. This PDF is a DM screen that I found. Someone had posted it on Reddit, and it's just a really quick reference kind of thing for a lot of the rules in the game that either get misinterpreted, uh, they get forgotten, or you just need to you know, be able to be like, okay, they just lit a candle, so how far can they see, and boom, it's right there. Granted, you might want to study whatever DM screen you're using, but it's not about the DM screen, it's about the fact that uh, Sumatra PDF uses less resources in order to run. So I can keep it open and I don't have to worry about my uh, CPU getting throttled or anything like that while I'm using it. Um, I can have multiple PDFs. As you can see, the 
like it's able to scroll through things rather quickly so it's also a really good uh pdf viewer just in general because it doesn't it's not like getting bottlenecked in terms of bandwidth or uh resource utilization so it's able to bring those images rather quickly so that's why i use sumatra pdf but you can use any pdf viewer but i would highly suggest having one on standby so that you can have things like a DM screen in a virtual environment. If you want to have a physical one, like on your desk, you know, that's fine too. But I highly recommend a PDF viewer of some sort. The next thing is OneNote. So OneNote is essentially my virtual notebook. I know a lot of DMs actually have a notebook that they go around and they take their notes and they have their whole entire campaign in that notebook. OneNote is essentially the same thing. It's a journal that you can keep as organized as you like. You can make all types of things happen in OneNote. So uh, let me actually do this to make it easier to see what I'm talking about. So for instance, I have on the side here, I've got D&D, so everything under d and I know is d and related. I've got some old campaigns that I have kept their notes in this tab. Uh, I've got a bunch of random tables and links to Reddit posts of things that help me run the game or maybe ideas, puzzles. I keep a uh, puzzles link right here. And then inside, you can have all these separate tabs. So. I've got a tab for like the main world information. I've got a tab that keeps track of every session, all the notes specific to the session. So if we go to session eight, we can see what I had had planned is right there. I didn't add these check boxes until later, um, but then I keep a summary of the session. I keep the notes of what I wanted to happen. And then in the middle, I usually keep like maybe special things that the players did that I'll need to look back on later to prep in the future. Uh, I have a, I, I started making sections over all the uh, different locations that are in the world that they could, you know, go and visit. But there's a better tool, I think, for this kind of stuff that I'll be getting to uh, next in a second. But OneNote is essentially, it's just a virtual journal. And the cool thing is if you have a OneDrive, which if you're running Windows, you should have a OneDrive and it should have enough of the free memory space or storage space rather for you to be able to utilize it with OneDrive on your account and keep synced. That way, when you move from device to device, you don't have to worry about having your file moved because it's in your OneDrive being utilized there. So I would definitely, I would definitely look into OneNote or some other type of cloud journal, if you will. I've heard people have success with uh, Google Documents and things like that. I don't know if there's like a Google Journal uh, that's linked to your Google account, but if there's something like that, that could also be something that you would use instead of OneNote, especially for Mac users and things like that. So the next uh, little bits of software are actually websites that I utilize. Uh, when I first started doing D&D, I actually utilized World Anvil because of the fact that there's, like you're able to just make so much information available to the players at the push of a button. So you get all of these different tabs, you get all of these different, uh, I guess, documents and things like that. You can link them all together. You can put uh, photos and things like that onto it. And I know a lot of DMs actually run their games from World Anvil in terms of, I guess, visuals and things like that. Maybe not combat. I don't know exactly how it works with combat. And in all honesty, I haven't used it in my campaign for the last like year and a half or two years because I've converted everything from World Anvil to my OneNote or just to my head. Um, but it's, it's a great way to keep everything centralized. It's a great way to keep things organized as well. Like as you can see, you can make an interactive map uh, you can put little pins onto certain locations, click those pins, it'll bring up like a big old 
bunch of lore or notes that you have put for that location. You can make references to other sheets and things like that. And the thing about this functionality is it's great, but it's also available in Foundry itself. So Foundry, you can actually do a lot of this stuff. You could actually make like a token, which I think I've done on the world map here. So you can make a token, put it onto the location, and when you want your party to be able to see it, you, you know, edit the permissions or whatever, and then they can see it. So a lot of what World Anvil offers, I've actually converted it to my OneNote and my Foundry game to where it's kind, it's in general obsolete, but the great thing about it is that it is free. Um, I don't know if there's like a paid up tier or something that allows you to, you know, get more access, but if anything, you can use this as a template to essentially store your information to figure out how to organize everything because you may not have thought of oh maybe i need to branch out from just the location and have all the shops but now i have all the shops i need to branch out to all the npcs in the shops but now i need to you know you can go all types of ways using world anvil as a template and then modifying that to either your foundry or your one known or just keep it World Anvil uh, and use it as all of your lore centralized in one location. That is also a way to use it. Uh, the next thing is going to be the calendar app that I use, or rather the website. It's called fantasycalendar.com. The cool thing about this is you can make multiple calendars. Uh, I have this one for my world of Borodil, and there's a couple of... I believe there's a couple of standard templates that you can use, or you can make your entire own custom calendar using this uh, website. But you can, once you get into the calendar, you can determine what day it is, so you'll know. When it's that day, you can create an event, you can title it whatever you want, put the description. There's a bunch of different presets and settings that you can add to it as to like how many times it uh, will repeat itself or things and what's really cool is you can send a link to this to your party and there's two versions of it there's a like a essentially a master version aka the editor uh, so i see everything on it obviously but you can make things not be seen by those that have the link unless you set uh, some sort of permission up so i believe this monguzu fed one for instance I believe this is a hidden event. So this was mainly for me to be able to tell what happened that day, or maybe I've uh, said something and the party maybe didn't catch on. So I put it on here hidden. That way when we get, you know, a couple months down the line, I'll be like, oh, hey, look, uh, this event is happening on the next day because of something that happened a long time ago. So you can put in as much uh, or as little information that you need. I usually keep track, like the main reason I use this is to keep track of the session that we just played and how many days or what days it transpired onto the map. So as you can see, uh, like this day, for instance, on the third day, they spent one, two, three, four, five sessions on a single day because <laughs> there was a lot of RP and a lot of combat. So a lot of not really moving forward in the story, especially not moving forward in the day because they spent five sessions of about four hours each on a single day doing so much stuff. So this really helps you keep track of how long has the campaign been going in the world and just helps you kind of plan out, like you can plan out, you know, things in the future that you want to happen. So maybe, maybe you want on the fourth day, like you come up with a really grand idea, you can put it here, keep it there for later, make sure your party doesn't see it. It's just, it's a really wonderful app for the functionality of keeping track of time specific information, things like that. And the last piece of software slash the last website that I use and have up all the time during my sessions is the Fantasy Name Generators website. Um, Emily right here has made a bunch of different name generators. I don't know exactly how she does it, but I'm pretty sure uh, all of it is 
you, all of it's useful. And uh, under the pop culture, there's actually a Dungeons and Dragons page right here. And a lot of the main creatures or the main uh, races that you'll find actually have their own generators. So you end up going to looking for these things. And every time you click on it, it'll give you another, uh, I think it gives you 10, yeah, 10 random names. A lot of them are gonna give you male or female variants. So, and like you can click through this for hours and well, probably not hours. Eventually you're gonna get repeats for sure. Uh, I don't know, like I said, I don't know how the functionality is behind the screen. I'm sure I could look it up if I wanted to but I'm not really worried about it. But at the click of a button, you know, a lot of DMs fe uh, fear when their party is walking through town and is like, I wanna talk to this guy. And they're like, oh, what's your name? And you're like, Shh, I don't have a name ready for this guy. Well, now with the push of the button, whatever race you gave them, you just go to that generator, you start clicking uh, through the names and you find one real quick and this helps a lot with the improv portion of D&D, &D, but it also helps you get your mind going on what a cool name would be when you're actually prepping a new PC, or NPC rather, for the players to mingle with and get to know. So, highly recommend the Fantasy Name Generators uh, website, and it's not just players as well, like they've got uh, different names for like clans and I've actually used this to find ships or towns or continents, countries uh, actually all of the countries or empires rather in my campaign besides Titania and the City of Guilds were all pulled from this website so uh, thanks Emily for what she does and definitely check it out because it is a free resource and there's really no reason not to use it unless you're just really good at making names. A bonus piece of software that I will talk about real fast um, is for a DM that wants to stream their games. Uh, and that is obviously OBS. I use OBS Live specifically because of the Stream Elements uh, software uses this a lot more um, in terms of, I, I think you can get it ported to other versions of OBS, but there's like a lot of different versions out there. And I just recently started using OBS Live as opposed to Streamlabs OBS. There's, I don't, again, I don't know all the ins and outs, but the, the fact that Stream Elements, a lot of it is web-based and then you get a link to the web-based like profile and scene that you have created you post it in there and now it's there so all of my alerts are tied to the website so i don't have to keep them locally if i don't want to i do keep pretty much everything that i've ever used i have somewhere on a hard drive on my computer uh it's just a matter of finding it or not so that's, that's if you're going to be streaming your games to Twitch, which could be a way for you to actually uh, play the game too, if you think about it, because you would be able to stream the game to Twitch, your party could jump into the chat, and like if you don't have Discord for whatever reason when you're running your games, so. But yeah, OBS, just a nice uh, piece of equipment there uh, for getting your games onto the web. So, those are my top 10 most utilized resources that I use almost in every single session. So I use Foundry Virtual Tabletop. That is how I actually run the games. That's how I do my prep. I use Voice Meter. That's how I get all my sound where I want it to be during the session, as well as just in everyday computer use. I use Discord to get the information to my players. Uh, to speak with my players, to see my players once they start using the camera, and just to generally interact about the campaign and the game itself with my players. I use Morphvox to change my voice if I'm not able to physically do it. I use Jingle Palette in order to make a soundboard for little jingles and little sound clips that I want to play, but I don't want to have to utilize like iTunes or something like that. 
I use Sumatra PDF as a PDF viewer. Uh, that's also where my DM screen is placed all the time so that I can quickly reference it if I need to or get stumped on something. Uh, I use OneNote for all of my notes and my journal and uh, essentially my like thought process prep. Um, you could end up turning the OneNote into Foundry and keep track of everything in Foundry. But OneNote, the reason I specifically use it is because it's cloud-based. So it doesn't matter what machine I'm on, I'm able to get a hold of that data. I used World Anvil to keep track of all the world lore. I used it at one point to make inter interactive maps and things like that. But I don't utilize it anymore because Foundry Virtual Tabletop has a lot of the functionality of World Anvil built into it. And if it's not built into it, it can be with mods. I use the calendar, uh, fantasycalendar.com, in order to keep track of world events and time-based events, as well as to keep track of what day the party currently are in the world and keep track of the uh, secrets that are gonna happen later. And I use fantasy name generator in order to come up with either uh, the names for the NPCs, names of players, names of locations, you name it, it's got it for sure. And finally, OBS, uh, it's a staple in the streaming community. You're going to need a version of OBS. I use OBS Live to use utilize streamelements.com. So I'll make sure that this video has all the links to every bit of software that I use in the description below. So hopefully this has helped you to sort of streamline your virtual uh, experience in the world of D&D. &D. And until next time, we'll see ya. Peace.